Can you imagine it's already four weeks? I feel like it came too soon. Should have made this series eight weeks. I would have enjoyed more. We would have slowed down a little and maybe gone to 70,000 feet to see what that looks like. I was on a flight yesterday from Kisumu and we were doing 17,000 feet and it was very noisy. When you are flying at 17,000, it's very noisy. When you reach 44,000, it's very quiet. But it also means that you are going very far. You are going very, very far. And we will finish our service today quietly. Quietly. Our service is in two parts, and I'll explain that to you in just a moment. Let me just register my heartfelt thanks to you, Pastor Chuchu, for being such an amazing pastor and for hosting me very well. I speak to, to your boss every evening. We talked yesterday, I think. And uh, I keep giving him the amazing reports of this congregation. The energy is awesome. You are, somebody can get addicted to you very fast. But I want to thank you for your welcome, for your, your hospitality. And the greatest compliment you can pay any pastor is to do what he has preached through. Because the word is not mine, it is the Lord's word. And all of us are under that same sentence of how God wants us to respond to the word. It is by being sensitive to what the Lord is telling us to do. And the things which he tells us to do are not easy, but they are worth it. And that is the greatest compliment that we can offer to our church and to the body of Christ. It is interesting that today we served communion because the book of James reminds us that we are family. If you forget anything else, remember that this book reminds us that we are we are family. That is it. And so sharing in communion reminds us that when you read through 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that Pastor Chu just read, Paul begins by lambasting that church. And he's saying that when you come to the Lord's table, it's not even the Lord's table that you celebrate. Because ideally, the Lord's table is supposed to be a monthly dinner together. And it's a potluck where everybody brings food so that we share together in that meal. So we have simplified it by making the meal the same. <laughs> but in Paul's day, some people who are rich used to bring choice meals. They used to go and have a whole mbuzi roasted. And it has all sorts of uh, beautiful things added on it. It is well marinated. And you really feel like this was made in a hotel. And the guys who just brought a simple gideri, nobody wanted your food. So you find you are told, well, you are na gideri, mukai pandeile. But the people who brought a nice choma from the hotel were eating on this side, and there was discrimination. And Paul said bad things about them. And today, we are talking about discrimination. The, the, the way we ignore the poor and favor the rich. That's what this final sermon is about. But if you forget everything else, Everything, please remember this from James. Christianity is not what you say. Christianity is what you do. If all of us were mute, none of us could speak. How will our neighbors know we are believers? That's a question in this book. How will people know you are born again and you know God if you could not speak? That's the message of James, implying that sin starts in our hearts and it's manifested, we protect ourselves with our words. And words, I promise you, do nothing for you. They don't do anything. If you introduce yourself as a born-again Christian, tongue-talking, spirit-filled, heaven-bound, demon-chasing, it does not make you more Christian. And so I'm asking you today by the utterance of God, to stop using your words to defend you. Allow your actions to introduce you, not your words. Is that clear? That is who we are. Do something. Behave in a way that people follow you and they ask you, by the way, are you a Christian? Because your actions say something different. Refuse to participate in the dirty deals in the office. Refuse to gossip about people. Refuse to dishonor people. 
Refuse to be disobedient to God's word. Refuse to be noted in your heart when it comes to God's word. And be easy and quick in obeying God's word. And let those actions direct people to ask you, are you a Christian? That's a more powerful testimony. Don't go to the office day one and you're introducing yourself as a born again Christian. I go, from, I go to TCT. In fact, I'm an usher in that church. And then people start watching you. And before long, you trip up. And suddenly, your whole reputation, the reputation of your pastor and your whole congregation is down the drain. Because people say, that person who steals sharpeners from the office goes to TCT. <laughs> See, that's what happens. Because you are letting your words set you up. Allow your actions to speak more about your faith. James reminds us that tough times are good for us. Now, it is not that God wants you to be a miserable Christian. God wants us to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God wants us to be reliable people because bad news doesn't shake us. Being auctioned doesn't shake you anymore because now you can be an encouragement to someone who's going through a tough time. But don't be the kind of person who avoids tough times. You will never mature, I promise you. And every test of God that we dodge, we don't grow from. And we can stay a baby Christian even though you say you have been saved for 27 years. But your actions so show after six months, Auna, because tough times crack you up. So James reminds us to count it all joy because the end of it is a good thing. He reminds us that. Then please remember from chapter 2, don't slander one another. Don't do it. Allow yourself to feel terrible if you speak badly of any Christian, especially in their absence. Honor one another. As a church, do that. Be of the habit of speaking well of your church and of each other. And I'm not saying that you lie. I'm saying if you have an issue, confront that person directly. Cindy, if you have an issue, confront them directly. But do not talk behind their back. It is very dishonoring and it is cowardly. That's what James reminds us. Last week, James reminded us that if you can be proud, there's no sin you cannot commit. In fact, you only need to be proud. That bad pride. And there is no sin you cannot commit. In fact, C.S. Lewis said, pride is the only sin. It is the mother of all sins. It is the seed of every sin you can commit. And God cannot bless a proud person. He can love you, but his love can't rest on you because pride is a creation of his enemy, the devil. It's the personification of the devil himself. And so God cannot be in relationship with a person like that. Paul reminds us that together, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, all of us. We are God's house. And communion reminds us that we are the same. We have different personalities, but we are saved by the same blood and the same grace. And so we need to remember that from Paul. Today, we are talking about the rich also cry. It's a peek into uh, who's a rich person and what is the danger of discriminating against people who don't have. Now, this thing is very common in Nairobi Chapel and Trinity churches. That can subtle discrimination. That can think people, there are people who would never come to this church. Do you agree with me or not? They would come here once and feel we uko ni kwa madongera. Uko, wow, 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 wow. I cannot step there. I can't. And they would just need to look around and look at you and know apa there was a church that was receiving a new pastor. They had been having an influx of pastors in and out, in and out. Finally, they, they prayed for and, and, and interviewed a very, very good pastor. And he asked, what, what are the challenges in that church? So he was told, ah, the way people are over there, they, so on the day he was coming, like, like you guys, you're very honoring and they were prepared, and people dressed up. And they were waiting, and waiting, and waiting. 
and the pursuit was not arriving. Finally, there, there was a very a commotion at the entrance because someone was about to disrupt the service and a smelly, smelly, dirty beggar. They used to see him outside the church every Sunday as they come for nearly a month. And the guy was reeking so badly, they used to avoid him. Now, they used to pray that he goes away not to embarrass their celebrations. But that guy, Kumbe, had sneaked in. And they were saying, Sasum, Sasum, say. Then he was quite strong, so he actually ran to the stage. And now they were embarrassed because some bouncers came to stop him. And then he went and took the microphone and he started uh, removing uh, item after item what he was wearing. And his dirty whatever, security were trying to... And he went ahead and removed item after item. Finally, a heap of clothes were left there and underneath was a brand new suit with a collar. And he told them, I'm your new pastor. I've been watching you for a month. <laughs> Each of you. I've been watching how you pass by me. And told that lady, you, you're the one who insulted me <laughs> uh, out there three weeks ago. And this guy, this bouncer is the one who nearly beat me just last week. None of you gave me anything at your very entrance because you thought I was this close. That's what he said. And very sadly, he declined the job. He said, I would never want to be a member of this church because what you showed me out there is you. And today, our idea is to open your eyes to the plight of people around you. Because this does not impress God, I promise you. What impresses God is everything we have been up to today, coming into church. You know, ever since churches developed a stage <laughs> and had a microphone and people are sitting there, people have been encouraged to pretend Church happens at e-groups. That's where the reality of church is. There you cannot pretend. If I, if, if I want to do something to measure the genuineness of a church, you cannot do it on a Sunday. You've got to dress up. And you see how I've been getting it right without the worship team dresses. I've been getting that right. You, you have to dress up. And there's something about dressing up that has a connection with how we need to behave in front of people. But if I visit your home, I find your husband there, I find your wife there, I find your children there, I find your dad there, I find who there. Ah, in a few, in a few minutes, there's no pretending. The, all the issues come out. All the issues come out. That's why Jesus often visited homes. He visited home. Home, home there's no pretense. Home, things are just the way they are. We talk about it there and find out what is going on. I might check into your house at 9 p.m. I discover the guy has not arrived. You wait until 2 a.m. That's when you are walking in. Okay, and we need to check. Okay, so your job keeps you away from your family till 2 a.m. We need to talk about it. Cindy, that's where the issues are. And so we need to address the issue of how do we discriminate against people. All of us would like to be wealthy. And it's not bad to be wealthy. In fact, there is nothing in poverty that glorifies God. Nothing. Nothing. The Bible does not say that it's a good thing to be poor physically. To be poor and hungry spiritually is great. But poverty by itself, there is nothing honoring God about it. Nothing. Don't ever cheat yourself at it. God wants me to be poor so that I can be humble. That is not from the Bible. You can be humble even though you are wealthy. And you can be very proud when you are poor. <laughs> you can be. So don't even get that into your mind. We are not glorifying poverty. But Jesus said you will always have the poor. And because of that, there's a certain posture we have to take about people who are doing worse than we are. And we need to be sensitive to them. That's what the Bible calls us to do. 
who is a rich person? Um, I was told once about the Kenyan dream. I don't know whether you know about the Kenyan dream. Uh, you know, the Americans have an American dream. The Arabs have the Arab dream. I don't know if there's an African one. But they say that the Kenyan dream is to have one really beautiful wife or very handsome husband. Just one. Okay, just one. The Kenyan dream is to have two very well-behaved children. The Kenyan dream is to have three acres of land in a plush area like Runda, Karen, Lavington, and on that, on those three acres, you've built your home. The Kenyan dream is to have a four-wheel drive car. <laughs> the Kenyan dream is to have five really good friends you can holiday with. The Kenyan dream is to have a f six-figure monthly income in dollars. <laughs> that if you achieve those things, they say you have achieved the Kenyan dream. You are living the life now. You are living the life. How do you know you are rich in Kenya? <laughs> you are rich in Kenya. Can we do a three-tire a, a, a three test? Let's do a three-tire test. You are rich in Kenya if you are not aware of how much bread and milk has increased by. <laughs> now, you may know it has gone up. It has gone up, you know. Even petrol, you know it has gone up. Like in by how much, Aujui? <laughs> if you don't know by how much, who can pesa? You're asking people, it has gone up, eh? Okay. But by how much, you don't care. If you feel it, you know exactly how much. <laughs> you are not there. <laughs> you are not there. <laughs> in Kenya, you are rich if your house help has a house help. When I'm dosing. Your house has to run home to go and release a house help. <laughs> you are good. <laughs> you are rich in Kenya if either COVID or Mandamano doesn't actually affect your lifestyle. You thrive. More houses were built in Kenya during COVID than any other time. Because finally the rich had time. <laughs> they, they got a break. They said, hey! Good, all our clients are at home. Let's build a house. So many houses came up in Kiambu during COVID. So it's a break for you. <laughs> oh my God. Um, the rich are different, I tell you. I once had a conversation with a guy who is a, a, a third generation uh, wealthy person. So we know about their family. A lot of people know about their family. But I, I, I was thinking we are the same until that day. So this guy had studied uh, he, he, abroad. He'd been in Australia for like 15, 16 years. And I just come back and he had been in Kenya for just a short while. So he started attending the church we used to go to and he joined our youth fellowship. So many of us had just started working. So he attended a meeting we were having for investments. So this guy was coming. Uh, I think the guy was from Centum. And he was telling us how to invest, you know, uh, how to put some money aside. Nini, kila kitu, then the money starts to grow. He was actually talking to us about compound interest because the fellowship had about 60 people. And the guy was there listening, listening, listening. Finally, he pulled me aside. But he was not too far from other people. And he told me, this guy has been telling us that every month you put aside something. I said, yeah. He said, why the end of the month? What happens at the end of the month? <laughs> so I'm like, for real? I mean, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, he kept saying, put something aside at the end of the month. I told him, that's when people get paid. He said, oh! So, <laughs> some guys heard it and they were a bit upset. So they were coming to him, they were telling him, how can you tell us you don't know what happens at the end of the month? You, Kwani, you don't pick a salary? The guy said, no. So if you need to shop, you need to go buy stuff, what do you do? He said, but I use our family card. Okay, then we looked at him, the guy, he was in some very old shoes, and his car, Gary me chapa. We're telling him, okay, we know you guys have money, why do you wear this kind of shoes? The guy said, but they are comfortable. 
and your car? You mean, can you go to Diti Dobi and get a stretch Mercedes? The guy said, yes, but it would be for? I would need it for what? Because this car, it actually, it, it, it's 15 years, but it actually moves. It works. And guys started, now guys are on his case. They are like, you guys, you are so arrogant. You are like, what? Then the guy just told all of us, guys, um, we are not the same. <laughs> yeah, we, I'm sorry. We, we are not the same. Our thinking is not the same. The things you think about are not the things we think about. Then he went ahead to explain. He said, our family alone we have, yeah, we have land. Yes, you know who my dad is. I'm actually a third generation uh, child in that family. It's true, I don't know about fees. I don't, I've never bothered about fees. I've never been chased out of school. In fact, the schools we go to abroad, all our family members all go to those schools. But he said, but for us, our family alone, not now with our cousins and everybody else, my mom, dad, and just us, we have 13,000 employees. 13,000 employees, just us. Our conduct and our reputation matters for the business. I'm the first person in my dad's business in the morning. I get to the office at 6.30, and I'm usually the last person to leave because my reputation and my industry and hard work is an example to so many people. If our family gets into a situation of disrepute, we damage the family name. And so for me, I can't be, I can't live a lifestyle that miscommunicates my family name. It's important for me to be discreet and to work hard because many, many families depend on us. But then he asked us, you cannot handle the challenges that my family handles. If you are given even one challenge that my family goes through, you can't take it because our tears are different. <laughs> We cry in private. When we are in debt, it is in billions. And billions. Our reputation is worldwide. Because prime ministers and presidents know us. So we can't afford to do the things you can afford to do. We were silenced. Psst. Like that. We are not the same. That that hit us really hard. The rich have different kinds of problems. The rich say, we can't just walk to our neighbor's. You know, we just walk to your neighbor's house. It matters that, hey, why did you walk to come? The different kind of problems. Uh, you can't just have one car or, or a car of a certain registration it appears petty, but they each judge each other on very different things. You can't, be, you can't not belong to a club. Why not? You can just sit at home. You don't belong to a golf club. It's a different kind of stress. <laughs> it's a different kind of stress. You have to go on holiday. Never wish you were rich if you cannot take the challenges that come with being rich. If you can't be aware that you are responsible for families and how they live. And people predicate their whole future on your thinking. Never wish you were rich. How many of you remember a boxer, an American boxer, former world champion called Mike Tyson? Mike Tyson blew three trillion Kenya shillings equivalent in 10 years. They measure that in 10 years he was paid nearly 3 trillion. 3 trillion is Kenya's budget. He blew it in 10 years. Mike Tyson used to be paid 30 million US dollars per fight. But he blew it and had to look for a job at one point. If you watch Mike Tyson's interview, there's actually a movie called Tyson. Tyson says there's nothing worse than God can do to you than to give you everything you want. When every wish of yours is met, when every person wants to be your friend, 
You can't tell who is fake and who is real. You can't. At one point, Mike Tyson had an accident in his Rolls Royce with a very dilapidated car. The guy just came and hit him. And suddenly, out of the Rolls, Mike Tyson came out with bulging muscles. And the guy who had hit him just thought, I'm dead. I'm dead. He came out with four goons who looked worse than him. Tyson looked at him and told him, you hit my car. And the guy was trembling, said to apologize. You know what Tyson did? He gave him the keys to his Rolls. And then he went and bought another one. <laughs> you, know, you hit the car, you repair it and keep the car. He said, even when I was doing those things, I wasn't happy. I didn't have a struggle. A lot of us wish we could do that. But there's a point you reach. Imagine at that point the guy said, I used to contemplate suicide. You think money is a solution? No, it's not. There's something sweet about something you need to struggle for. And you cherish things a little more and value them. Three trillion. For a lot of us, two million itakumaliza. Itakumaliza. There's a dad who told me, if I want to kill my son, he was an alcoholic, I need to give him 10,000 shillings. He'll be dead. He will go and take the cheapest liquor and drink himself to death. So God is very gracious in how slowly he grows you. He wants you to be mature and complete, lacking. We are now at about 35,000. Are you feeling it? Be careful what you wish for. And there are some things which God denies you because he knows you. God knows you. You are here. Kosa bo umesota. Yani yo dili ki come through. Ah, the next time we'll see you in church. Apana. He'd rather grow you spiritually. <laughs> grow you, grow you, grow you. Mashida zikuche, zikuche, zikuche. When you're matured. Ah, yeah, yeah. You'll make your first million. But it, it will come when you're about 45. Say you want it at 29, apana. Uta daddy. You will become so arrogant. You're not going to believe who you are. You are not going to believe who you are. That's how God has done for me and my wife. He has really grown us very, very slowly. I saw the first million in my account when I was 38. 38. I used to dream, oh God, please, let me just see seven figures. From the time I was 25. Ah, no. No, no. God knows you. God, and even then, it didn't come to my individual account. It came to a group account. God made sure that we were a group. So, so you cannot take the million and run. So you start to grow it slowly as a group. In Africa 12. In Africa 12 million because you're a group. It figured quite quickly because we bought the, the Kenjian share. It split. And suddenly you say, yeah, I have, I have a million. And then the group doesn't allow you to leave. Thank God, a majority of them were kikuyus. Unenda pina pesa yetu, baki hapa we muluya. So it stayed. But slowly I have really come to appreciate. I have really come to appreciate. I really thank God. My cute friends, I would never have bought my house if it was not for them. If all the friends are surrounded by luyas and luos, akuna. No, 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 no. We would have bought that car long ago. They said, stay here, una pesa. Indi unaita pesa. Bayi ni bado siyo pesa. It stayed and stayed and grew and grew and grew and grew. God is so good and cares for you so much. Be careful that which you want so much. So James does not lambast rich people. He lambast rich oppressors. You can be rich and very oppressive. That is the point. Be careful how quickly arrogance can creep into your heart because uko na pesa. And that's where discrimination comes from. That's where people feel so and so has money. This guy is a politician. You know, so you start to favor him at the expense of people who are poor. James says, be very careful. That attitude, God hates it. He really hates it. God would like you to be very wealthy, but very humble. 
Because you can just do more when you are wealthy. You have, it's like fuel. Money is like fuel. You can go further. It's easier to deal. It's easier to be good. It's easier to be more practical when you have something in your hand to give. You don't go somewhere with words only and empty-handed. It's easier. But it's also easier to have more fears when you have more money. Because you are so scared that it can leave. And the moment you get there, God will remove it. So there's an attitude we need to have when we are rich. James chapter 5. We are reading verse 1 to 6 and then verse 13 to 19. Our service is in two parts today. So we are going to talk about this part of discrimination. And then when we are just about halfway, we are going to pray. Because he finishes the second service, the second part of James by talking about prayer. And we've lined up our prayer counselors, so we'll pray for you. And for a lot of you, God is going to heal you. God is going to transform you. God is going to change you. And God is going to answer your prayers today. Okay? Today. 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 God is going to do it for you today. James says, now listen, you rich people. Those were the oppressors. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted. And moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your loans are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself for the, in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not even opposing you. Are you seeing? That's where James is coming from. So the first part of prayer is like this. If you have an employee, okay, if you have someone you've employed, like a mamafua, a house help, a gardener, even a person who takes care of your dog, anyone who depends on you because you work for their livelihood, please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. I want you to know that your life, someone depends on it. Okay? You are important to God. You know the people you employ can't even afford to be mad at you. Because if they are mad at you, their job is over. Their livelihood is done. And so I want to pray that God will bless you. And that the prayers they pray over you will reach the ears of God. You know, they already pray. <laughs> they already pray for you. They, they go to sleep, maybe crying. What James is saying here is, people mow you alone and you don't pay them. Why? People wash your clothes and you don't pay them. Why? You have money in your pocket and you tell them, come back after two weeks. Why? Because you, you have something that can take you through. But what about them? But a lot of you, even that, that seems very little that you pay your house help, it supports a home. And here he's saying their cries reach God. May you be kind to those that you employ, those people who depend on you. You create employment in our nation. So be kind and be gracious to them. Let us pray. Beloved Father, I thank you for anyone who's up on their feet right now, the families that depend on them. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would bless the work of our hands, that in our industry and in our work, those who pray that we don't lose our jobs, those who pray that we don't get fired because it means then they are finished, we who it is so easy to change house helps and to change a mama fua and to change so and so, allow that we'll be gracious employers towards your glory and towards your praise. I pray for each and every one of you that the Lord will increase the harvest of your righteousness that in your hand you will prosper. I pray that you'll be promoted, that you'll be rich, that in your hard work 
then you'd be a gracious employer towards God's glory. So the cries that come from the people you employ will reach God's ears with grace and that God will then promote you because you are such a good employer. We ask these things with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Wealth Index in Kenya reads like this. The IMF and the World Bank and United, uh, United Nations Habitat Statistics say that less than 0.1 of the Kenyan population, that is about 8,300 individuals, own more wealth than the bottom 99.99% of Kenyans. This is the disparity of Kenya. 0.1% of our 47 million people own more wealth than the rest of us. Because Kenya has super rich people and super poor people. It's very abnormal. The richest 10% of the people in Kenya earned an average 23 times more than the poorest 10% of Kenyans. And it's growing really fast. In Kenya, people just know how to dress. But deep down, what to anaumia? You can actually dress like you're a millionaire. But deep down, your struggle is personal. And so in a church like this one, don't take it for granted that people are doing well. Just because you've learned how to dress up. <laughs> it is true. It's actually true. We, we just know how to laugh at our problems. But Kenya is not a rich country. We are not. Don't even cheat yourself. The richest country in the world is Luxembourg. It's the richest country in the world. They have no debt. They have a 0.1% crime rate. It's a small, really boring country. Its politics are not exciting. They have 2.9, 3.2 probably percent million people, of which 2 million are millionaires. And they are considered middle class. Transportation is free, as is Wi-Fi. Everywhere. They have rich, and then they have middle class. And so if you're homeless, it's because you're homeless by choice. Maybe you have a mental issue, so you run away from home. <laughs> but that is, they have just two classes. <laughs> Luxembourg. <laughs> that is how God wants us to be. It's fair. By the way, their, ta their taxes are 50%. They are taxed 50% by government. So the government takes care of roads. They take care of everything. These Wi-Fi things are government provided. Every hospital is top class, like the best hospital in Kenya. Uh, Medicare is free because the government does that. It's easy to mistake government for God. It's very easy because government cares government cares. So they have two classes. Kenya has five tiers. Five. Five. Kenya has got the super rich. Most of them are politicians. Super, super rich. People have obscene amounts of money. The rich in Kenya. You wouldn't believe. Then uh, the second tier in Kenya are middle class who are often in debt. You are working, but so you're not really free if you owe someone. But but you, you drive a big car, but people cannot tell And then the third class of Kenya is the working poor. You work, but the money you get, if you don't have a side hustle, cannot take you from um, first to thirty first. It can't. So you are in debt. You know why? Because the, the fourth class is the not working poor. It's the people who are staying with you because you take care of them. So actually, that's why you're poor. Because you can't. You are feeding all these people. Some of you send money to shags. You send money to people, to your bro, your sister, who's in school somewhere. You're supporting them. So you're working, but you're stressed. And then the final tie of Kenya are the destitute poor. 
Now they are the ones who are lame. They are the ones who cannot work even if they wanted. They are the aged, their parents, who now you have to support. So we have three classes of poor. We are not a rich country. But you know why the rich keep becoming rich? Because they exploit the poor. That's why our slums are not going anywhere. It's the rich who have those Mabati uh, houses in the slums. One acre of little Mabati houses, one acre can house a thousand people. One acre. If you removed it and you move those people to better housing, okay, I'm not a supporter of, it's not a political statement, but if you moved people from there, I mean, in a place like Lavington or Runda, one acre is one house. Okay. It's lived in by seven people. In a slum area, those are a thousand people. And it's the super rich then who have interest in having land there. Because then if you have, if you have three acres and you're housing 3,000 people, and akulipa zile rento, you become rich on the backs of poor people. So poverty is money in Kenya. There are people who want the right ridiculous reports and proposals abroad on the basis of poor people. And this is the issue God has something against. I wanted you to stand so that you can realize you have power. You have power with you. And you can change somebody's life. You don't have to keep somebody there. Don't keep a house help for life. There's no person who says they went to, to school in order to become a house help. They don't want to be a career house help. Participate in helping their lives to be better, to leave your home, to get some education, to get something, so that they are not in your house forever. You have power to change somebody's life. The same with your gardener, the same with your mama fua. Change their life. Because this is what Kenya has become. We exploit the poor very, very much. I was once part of a team that went to Huruma. This story really makes me emotional. It was when COVID was just ending, so we were distributing care packs. You know, you put, you put some... Um, Unga, sugar, bread in, in a bag, and it cost what, a thousand bob? And we took it to a room. I went to a church by the invitation of a person who has a church there, and he said, We have so many poor people. We have to select only the ones that the church is aware of and bring them in the church compound. So we went to this church compound. I went to, I went to the law firm. And the number of people who are outside, were more than the people. What goes re around really fast? Now, some of you know that in a slum area, families do not eat an individual meal. I was learning at that time. You eat according to nyumba, nyumba tano, nyumba kumi. So whatever it is that somebody brings after their hustle in the day, it's easier to have somebody cook a meal for all the families. It's cheaper. So families do not know what it means to sit in their house to have dinner with their children. They don't know that. So here we are, people from Westlands. Tumefika uko, nasema, this is CSR, and went and we had these bags. Now there were many bags, nearly 400. And these guys were lined up, they were waiting, they were singing as we arrived. And then one of the ladies there looked at us and they said, Haya, umeleta mkate kwa nini? We were like, oh, should we have brought cake? <laughs> they were like, no, but Aki Museltem Kate, Tovunjua Nyumba. So we're like, uh -huh. So you know, as so we're deciding, at it, bring one white, one brown. Then they were saying, there is no kiosk here that keeps bread. So they are saying, because the way the bread is on top, people will see. And they know where we live. So the mamas were bringing lessons and they were covering the bread, but they were saying you should have stuck to rice and things like beans, and just that. So me, I was curious, like, bread, are you serious? There's no, I was in Kate. They said, no, they said, what we eat is anyona. I'm like, what is anyona? 
Anyona are bread crumbs, which they buy for their children from the factory that makes bread. Now you can buy anyona to fit your hand for a shilling. So they go to the factory and they pick the crumbs that are fallen on the side and they put it in a paper bag. And that is what they take and they mix it in black tea and their children drink before they go to school. That is the closest to bread they know. They are saying a full loaf, it is never seen here. This is in Nairobi. I was in so much shock. Then they were saying, mama, mama, nani yuko hapi leo? They're saying, leo imekuwa tanyaki kupeleka mtoto town. So the people you see by the roadside with a child, that child is really out for hire. So the community baby like this one, and people know that babies affect the rich. So that child is hired every week. The child has become a community child. They don't even know who they belong to anymore. But it's up to you. You take that child and go, you're going to hustle. Then they have a mulika muizi. Whatever you get, you have to send. Because it's going to feed people. Whatever you will eat there, you and that child in Tao, is up to you. If you're going to get molested, if you're going to be harassed by parkies, that's up to you. So some people talk at you, oh, you know, these guys, sometimes they are dropped by rich people. What they do is they gather together because you have to get to town. Then they hire someone who has a car and you drop them to town. And then they come back. There is a class of poverty in our country. It makes me so angry when I think that there are people who do not retail bread and where they endanger the life of a child because they are good for begging. So that whatever change you have, you can give to them. It upsets me. And you can imagine what it does to God. Coming to a TCT church like this one is a privilege. It's privilege. It's privilege. And you can help. So please, the next time you go to God and you cry that you are poor, you are not poor. You can share. You can change somebody's life. I need you to be sensitive to your neighbors. Never judge a Kenyan by how they dress. No, behind that dress there is real struggle. But we can share. The Bible says in Exodus, those who had much did not have too much. And those who had little did not have too little. That is God's balance. That's how countries like Lux Luxembourg operate. God will bless a country that does not know him that have concern for the poor, like all the Arab nations. They can't tolerate poverty among them. So they give. In their national budget is something for the poor. In their religion is something for the poor. But for us, those who live in those palatial homes, those super trillionaires, never bother. In fact, they need the poor to make them rich. That's why God says your wealth has rotted. You will enter heaven and you'll be in shock in shock about how God thinks about you because of the cry that has reached him. The Bible says he who lends to the, who helps the poor, lends to the Lord. And the Lord will repay you for what you have done. So if you can't help, help. Share. Share. There's no day you'll feel like now you are doing well. No. But you can share. In fact, I've been told, if you want somebody to help you, Go to a person who is struggling. A person who is not struggling will start reading for you principles to make money. <laughs> and they leave you the way you came. They say, why can't you think more seriously about life? I love what I did. But a person who has slept hungry, A, they will know it's not funny to sleep hungry. And they help you. TCT, I'd like you to become like that. Much more sensitive to your neighbors. So today... What we need to do as we move to the second part of our service is purpose to buy something worth about 500 bob and bless a less fortunate person. How many of you know a person who's less fortunate than you? Can I see your hand? You know a person who's less fortunate than you? Please do it. If you can afford more, it's fine. Buy practical things. Buy some unga. Buy. I think you can buy bread. Eh? 
here you can buy bread. But just go and bless them. The most you can do is pray with them. But please never let it look like you're doing a, 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 a pitch for your church. It will take away credit from God. Just say, I just wanted to bless you with this. Because you can share. You can share. Some of them are your relatives. Some of them are your neighbors. Some of them. But don't assume. Just go and say, I just wanted to bless you with this. Don't ask them, do you need some? No, don't. Just, just go give them. Just go give them and be a blessing to them. I'd like to ask our prayer counselors to please come forward. We want to take some time now to pray. And we'll have some anointing oil here. Um, James finishes the last part by advocating for prayer. And prayer is extremely powerful. So I'd like you to please come and you can set the anointing oil here. I'll explain something and then I will, I will come up and join the prayer team. Now this is where it becomes very quiet. Okay? Because climbing to 44,000 feet is where you can pray. Okay? We want to pray. We want to pray. James says, is any among you in trouble? Is any among you in trouble? I don't know how you define trouble, okay? But he says, let them pray. Now, why I find the prayer of James very different is because James used to observe his brother Jesus, his half-brother. And Jesus was very prayerful, extremely prayerful. And so, we're offering this opportunity to you. Don't be ashamed of knowing that God is offering a way out. Whatever kind of trouble you're in, it could be emotional trouble, it could be financial trouble, it could be psychological trouble, it could be a, a mistake you have made. It doesn't even matter to God. God's grace is so amazing that God offers you, are you in trouble? He says, pray. And we want to offer you that prayer today. Are you happy? He says, then sing and celebrate. It's fine. I don't want you to manufacture problems so that you appear spiritual. If you are in a space where you are saying God has been a big blessing to me, then that's fine. It's time for you to celebrate. And you can also come and say, honestly, I don't have a challenge. I'm just here to thank God that he has given me a peaceful week. All credit goes to God for your times of peace. There was a time you were in trouble, maybe now you are not. It's still fine. Is anyone among you sick? Let the, Call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. So the Lord is going to heal you. And you can come on behalf of a person who is not well, if they could not be here. And they will be healed. I'm telling you, I've seen, you the, I've seen this more times than I can count. Come with your trembling faith. God needs just that. You are, you, are, you are walking to the front is your sign of faith that God, I am trusting you. Now, if you can do it yourself, it's okay. Stay where you are. But if you need God's help, then walk to the front. There's a level of vulnerability that God needs to see to know, okay, this is your sign of faith. That's why Jesus used to say, your faith has healed you. He needed to see something. you coming, even trembling. It says, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. up. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Can you see how good God is? If you've sinned, God says you'll be forgiven. Don't even tell us the sin. Just say, I am in a mess. I need the Lord to forgive me. And the Lord will forgive you. Therefore, he says, have the habit of confessing your sins to each other and praying for each other so that you may be healed. This is in line with slandering one another. Say, I'm so sorry, my mouth has been so foul. If you need to walk up to someone and say, please, I'm not going to do this again. I want my mouth to be an honoring mouth. This is the kind of character God wants a church to have. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So this is why this team is here. They are not knowing about this this morning. 
They knew about this in the week. And so they have prepared themselves to come and pray for you. They are not perfect. We are not perfect. I'm not perfect. But these are the scriptures. You saw the scriptures promise. The scriptures promise that you will be healed. And so we're going to finish our service quietly. Quietly. So please, when the people are coming forward to be prayed for, um, respect their privacy as they come to the front. Uh, walk up with whatever issue it is. The prayer offered in faith will make you well. And we will finish the service in that quiet. Is that okay? Let's finish it in that silence. We are at 44,000 feet. Akuna kelele uko. The Lord is taking you far. The Lord is going to touch you. And the Lord is going to heal you. Organize with your pastors for a day when you hear testimonies of what the Lord has done. It is good to testify of what the Lord has done. This is a praying church. It's what I know since I came. And I know that you know what the Lord can do. And so trust God to transform you and to heal you. We'll play some music quietly, but we'll effectively just bleed the service out slowly as people pray. If you have no issue and the time has come for you to have to go home, please just leave us quietly. Is that okay? Just leave quietly without interrupting if you feel like the time has come. But if you know there's a burden in your heart concerning something you want God to touch you on, don't leave until somebody prays for you.